Welcome to the uh, Saratoga County History Center. We're really happy to, to have you here for our first program of uh, 2022. Um, this is sponsored by the Saratoga County History Roundtable. Today's program, the Lattimore Circle, is part of uh, Brookside Museum's focus on black history uh, for the month, for Black History Month and for the year. Uh, we're gonna tell you more about that in a minute. But first, I'd just like to introduce myself. I'm Jim Richmond. Uh, leader of the Saratoga County History Roundtable, which is associated with the History Center here in, uh, at Brookside Museum. I want to thank you for coming out today, especially with the weather. At 11 o'clock, at, at 10 o'clock it looked terrible, at 11 o'clock it looked great, 1 o'clock the weather looked terrible, but you made it. <laughs> so we thank you, and we also want to thank the people that are out on Facebook Live now, and special thanks to our uh, technical leader, uh, Sean Kelleher, Kelleher, who's leading the uh, uh, the uh, camera set up and is also the uh, uh, town historian for the town of uh, Saratoga. Um, not Saratoga Springs, but Saratoga. Um, we have many uh, events that are uh, scheduled this year. Um, the only two I would like to mention now is the one that you may have received in the handout um, that, as you came in. There's two events that are coming up in March. All right, we have, we have a unique program that we're doing in concert with the uh, uh, Waterford History and Cultural Center in Waterford, and the uh, Waterford um, town, the town of Waterford in Ireland. So it's going to be a, a kind of a three-part presentation. It's going to be on Zoom, and you can read about that um, in your handout. Uh, we're looking forward to that. It's part of the new collaboration that uh, Brookside Museum is working on in terms of connect, uh, co connecting with uh, other museums in the area. And then this will be uh, really our first international attempt at uh, doing some history. So we're uh, looking forward to that. And uh, there's more information on your flyer about that. It's March 12th at 1 o'clock on Zoom. About four weeks from today, we're going to have a program here. Again, similar to this, it's going to be a hybrid program uh, that's going to be led by uh, Lauren Roberts, who's a Saratoga County historian. And it's, it's going to be called Supporting the Poor in Saratoga County. And she's going to talk about the 130-year history of the, uh, of the Saratoga County Poorhouse which is in the town of Milton, and she'll do it. Uh, she's got a great program on that, and it does get back into a lot of the history of what, uh, how the poor were treated in the early years of uh, Saratoga County. So those two things we would certainly like to invite you and encourage you uh, to attend. Um, the Saratoga County History Center offers these programs on a regular basis, uh, along with many others. We're gonna be doing tours this year, community events, um, and many other activities. So. Um, if you are a member of the Brookside Museum, that's great. If you'd like to become a member uh, to be able to get the information on the activities and participate, you can simply do that uh, by going to uh, uh, brooksidemuseum.org. The uh, membership um, levels start at $25 for students and seniors, and I think uh, $35 for individual members. But uh, uh, the museum is in, in, an, in an exciting period of renovation and recharging what we do. And uh, we'd love to have all of you uh, a part of it and grow with us as we do that. So again, thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the, now our program that we're gonna have today. We're really pleased to invite you to the Lattimore Circle. It was a program that we actually booked back in November. And then a couple of us sat around and said, well, wouldn't it be nice to put together a little exhibit uh, related to black history in concert with this program? And uh, well, we did that, but uh, we bit off a lot at the time. <laughs> um, in November, we started this exhibit. It, it's out in the outer room here. And uh, it uh, was open two weeks ago on February 5th. Uh, we would love to uh, have you uh, uh, visit that you know, after the program. Uh, come back, with, uh, bring your friends and associates and family, because uh, it's a fairly dense exhibit. It's got a lot of information about black lives in Saratoga County over the last 200 years. And uh, we'd certainly uh, like to uh, uh, encourage uh, you folks, maybe some of you have seen the advertisements either on, on TV or in the newspapers about this exhibit. And uh, we're proud of it and we really would uh, like to uh, see uh, a lot of you folks uh, come back, a lot of your friends come back and do that. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, remind people that we had a number of people that were um, involved in that uh, exhibit, but one of them here is going to be one of our speakers today, Lori Weiss. So without further ado, I'll move on to the program uh, that Lori and Julie will do. Um, I'd just like to introduce our two presenters today for the Lattimore Circle. Lori Weiss um, has a master's 
in library science, recently retired as, as the local uh, history librarian at the Saratoga Springs Public Library. Um, she is also a librarian emerita from Union College, where she has served as the Adirondack Research Library at the Kelly Adirondack Center. And I've known Lori for a few years now, and as she is retired, she is no longer has any excuse to write that <laughs> book on Kate Ross Patton. Kate Ross was Patton. Uh, that she's going to do that her and I have uh, talked about for about six or eight years oh, now. So yeah, yeah. now she's going to do that. Our, our beginning speaker today is Julie O'Connor, who also has a master's in library science and master's in public administration. You betcha. Okay. Is also a retired librarian. It's nice to be a retired librarian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a little bit of both. And a New York State policy analyst. Afterwards, you'll have to tell me what that is, but not now. <laughs> <laughs> she was recently recognized by the uh, Paul Grandall, uh, by Gra Paul Grandall in the Times Union for extensive and deep knowledge of Albany history. She is best known for her blog, Friends of Albany uh, History, and as the county history tweeter, okay, the city, Albany city. Muskrat. The Albany Muskrat on Twitter. On Twitter. Yep. So uh, you can, you can uh, see and visit her activities there. Uh, Julie and Lori will be, present the fascinating story of the Lattimores, a free African-American family who lived in Albany, Moreau, and Saratoga Springs, uh, and it was active and influential in American history of the black community from the Revolutionary War into the uh, 20th century. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Julie and thank Lori. You. So thank you for coming. Okay. First, before, um, before we begin, I need to give a shout out to Sean Kelleher because we would not be here today if I hadn't pestered Sean and he charmingly helped me out and found me the link that brought the Lattimores into Saratoga County. I also have to sort of apologize. I'm a tad under the weather today. So if I like keel over, <laughs> Lori will be great. Um, I began researching Albany's black community in the 1800s, about three years ago, and I found Ben Lattimore Sr. and his service in the revolution from what Steve Belinsky had done in the Colonial Albany Project. Um, I did some digging and found out that he had a son who had been part of the Underground Railroad and he disappeared from Albany County. Well, that's where Sean came in and I found him in Saratoga in Moreau. I started making phone calls, including one to the county historian's office, to see if anyone had ever heard of the Lattimores in Saratoga County, and that's how Lori found me. I had received an inquiry as the local history librarian at Saratoga Public Library. I received an inquiry from Skidmore College, and it was very uh, interesting. They wanted to know if I had any information on a Mrs. Maddie Lattimore. Maddie Lattimore apparently was the first graduate from Lucy Scribner's School uh, for Industrial School for Women, which was the precursor to Skidmore College. They had nothing at Skidmore. I had little to nothing in the library other than a couple sentences, which basically pointed out that Maddie Lattimore was married to a black man in Saratoga Springs. And sure enough, in the trustees' minutes, we found a little note that talked about Maddie Lattimore colored. Um, I put it out of my mind because I, you know, I couldn't really, didn't really have anything. Um, and then I was at a meeting here with Jim and a couple other folks. We were working on the Saratoga County Oral History Project. And Julie had contacted Lauren Roberts. And I heard Lattimore. My ears perked up. And uh, we connected. So here we are. And what we're going to do today is to present some of our findings um, on this family's just fascinating history and connections to the area. The, oh, thank you. Um, the story of the Lattimores is one of love, loyalty, and service to their country when their country rarely loved them back. It's a story of physical and moral courage in the face of great obstacles. It's the story of a family's need to bring equal rights, social justice, to their black community over four, five, and possibly even six generations. It's the story of service and love for their fellow men and women and how that service adapted as the country changed and the needs of the African-American community change. It's also a fascinating story of how one black family, against all odds, 
manage to am amass significant wealth and take a place among America's black elite before Jim Crow in the South and the North took its toll. Um, as an aside, if anybody's watching Gilded Age, um, Julian Fellows introduced a plot line of a black family, and it's worth it. It's worth watching the Gilded Age, Gilded Age just to see what he does with that, because that begins to talk about a whole part of the 19th century African-American community that people know very, very little about, but the Lattimores were part of it. But most of all, it's the story of a loving family who protected, nurtured, and supported one another over generations. OK, most of what we know about Benjamin Lattimore Sr.'s early life comes from his petition here in the middle. I know you can't read it. It's very hard to read when you even have it in front of you. It was his 1834 petition for his pension from his service from the Revolutionary War. Ben was born a free man in Wethersfield, Con Connecticut, and he was the son of Benani, Benoni Lattimore and Mary Freeman. Uh, and he was named for his father, originally named for his father, Benoni. The family moved to New Marlborough, Ulster County, New York, sometime after 1762, when uh, Ben states he was born in his statement. Um, the family ran a ferry called Lattimore's Ferry in Ulster County. Uh, we believe that the ferry played a prominent, war in, prominent part in the Revolutionary War in that it was used to transport not only troops, but goods uh, uh, back and forth between New York and Connecticut and New England. Ben was captured. Uh, young Ben was about 17 years old when he enlisted in the Continental Army in 1776. And somewhere in there, his name changes to Benjamin. We're not quite sure how and why, but it does. He was captured in the Battle of Fort Montgomery, and there's a picture of the fort there. And you can see here on the upper right, it says missing in 1777. He was captured and at the Battle of the Fort and forced to act as a servant to the British officers. Well, she's gonna do with the black kid, right? When the fort was retaken by the Patriot forces, he returned to his fifth regiment and served to the end of the war. He returned to New Marbury, as he calls it in the piece. And that actually was really difficult to um, find then that it was New Marlborough. We had to tease through that. After his father's death in 1786, the family leaves the ferry business and scatters. Ben states he went to Poughkeepsie. And the trail runs cold until the mid-1790s when Ben and his young son, Ben Jr., settle in Albany. Now what you have to understand, oh, thank you. <laughs> what you have to understand is that Albany was a city that embraced slavery for almost 200 years. The first slaves, enslaved people, were brought to Albany in 1626, two years after it was first settled as Fort Orange. And so still in 1800, 10% of the population was enslaved and there were only 175 free blacks, about a third of the number of those who remained enslaved. Yet Ben and his young son thrived. Ben Sr. began purchasing property in 1798. He became a licensed city cartman, think a truck driver today, established a grocery store, and continued to acquire more real estate. He married an enslaved woman. We don't know whether he managed to purchase her freedom or whether he ma ma married her when she was still enslaved, named Dinah, and they had several children, William, Mary, and Betsy. So now he's got Benjamin Jr., who was born in 1792 and traveled to Albany with him, and the three young kids. Sadly, we, we believe that Dinah passed away young, and Betsy died when she was a child. By the 1800s, Ben Sr. was quite likely the most well-respected man in the black community. He was one of the founders of the African Meeting House on, land, on South Pearl Street 
on land he purchased from Elizabeth Schuyler Hamilton, widow of Alexander Hamilton. Uh, he was the head of the African, the African Mutual Aid Society. They called themselves the Albany African Society that helped with funeral expenses and helped widows and children, a founder of the first school for black children in the city, which is co-located with the Meeting House on the land purchased from Elizabeth Schuyler Hamilton, and he would become one of the founders of a very important African Baptist church in the city in 1821. The thing to think about is, is um, the money. This is an African American. Um, where, where did all this money come from? These, these things cost. And we've yet to kind of figure out where... Um, but we do know, Lori is, oh God, she, she does, she's the deed lady. She looks at the deeds, the mortgages, everything. And she's found out that his brother owned property in Poughkeepsie. Yes, the brother owned property in Poughkeepsie that they ultimately sell in 1826. And we find out about this in an 1806 um, will from his, his, Benjamin's brother, William, who we never knew about. <laughs> but there are all the kids listed and they're all given money. Sizable amounts of it. So here you have Ben in the early part of the 1800s and he's well respected by the black community and he's well respected by the white community because the school and church they built, over 80% of the funds came from the white community. So he's doing his thing and whatever, yet still in 1821, um, not unlike many other black men in the time, he had to appear before a city court judge and attest to the fact that he was free and that he had been born free. And in these documents, we get the only glimpse we have of who this man was. And he's described as a tall, spare mulatto with hazel eyes, and he's also identified by the witness, one of the witnesses as being of irreproachable character. Yeah, I'm just, um, sorry. Uh, in the later years, in the 1820s in Albany, he worked with the Reverend Nathaniel Paul who was one of three black abolitionist brothers who were all ministers, and they were located in Albany, Boston, and New York City. Um, and he was president of the African Temperance Society. Um, ben Sr. was so important that when slavery was abolished in New York State in 1827, he was the chairman of the committee that planned how Albany's blacks would celebrate the emancipation. He also played a significant role in the African Clarkson Society, which was named after Thomas Clarkson, Clarkson a British abolitionist who fought against slavery for decades. At that time, there was a huge parade through Albany streets and a thundering sermon by Reverend Paul on the need for all black Americans, even those in New York State, now they were free, to push for the abolition of those still enslaved. Um, if you Google it, you can still find a copy of um, Reverend Paul's oration on abolition. And it's pretty interesting to read. And basically he says, if none, if none of us are free if any of us are still enslaved. And so this is what he's doing in Albany. This is what his brother Thomas is doing in Boston. And this is what his brother Benjamin is doing in New York City. And he's now really begun to set the stage for what became a much overlooked until quite recently black abolition movement. It's not just white abolition. It's not just William Lloyd Garrison. It's black men and women doing what they need to do to get rid of slavery. Ben Jr. grew up in his uh, father's footsteps. Like his dad, he appears to have moved with equal, equal ease in the black and white, in black and white Albany. 
He was a trustee of Reverend Paul's African Baptist Church. He managed the grocery store and worked as a cartman as well. We think as early as 1830, he was involved in helping enslaved people secure their freedom through what would become known as the Underground Railroad. Junior became active in the fight for black rights and, uh, sorry, need to amend this. The father was also still active, although he was in his early 70s. He attended one of the first two colored conventions where about 50, man, 50 free men from all across the North met in Philadelphia. Um, their dad would meet William Lloyd Garrison and the other black men who would found the American Anti-Slavery Society, as well as white men, the driving force for abolition before the Civil War. The first revolution passed was to form a committee to oversee the building of a black school of higher education on land that had been donated near Yale University. Ben Sr. was a member of that committee. The resident, but the residents of New Haven refused to allow the school to be built. So they were, this is the first time black men all across the North, free black men, get together and start talking about politics and about social reform. Um, it's not just all abolition and slavery. It's how do we get the vote? How do we get our kids educated? How do we, how do we become good citizens so the white people will like us, basically? Um, it's hard to sort out sometimes what dad and son did because sometimes they put the senior after the name and sometimes they put the junior after the name. Um, in the late 1820s, we think it was Junior who became involved in providing assistance to women and children caught up in slavery court cases, um, who but for the aid of the Albany African Association and members of the New York State Manumission Society who had worked to abolish slavery in New York State and the Colonization Society, which basically said, yeah, even if we free blacks in the United States, they're not gonna have an equal, ch an equal chance, so maybe the best thing is to settle them all in Africa, specifically Liberia. Um, one of the most interesting things um, was a young woman who was brought to Albany by a man intent upon selling her into slavery. Through the in intervention of Ben Jr. and Reverend Paul, she was allowed to go free. In another instance, they helped two children brought to Albany whose owners seemed likely to send them to the notorious slave marks in the Deep South. The owner freed them in Albany, and the children were entrusted to the care of Reverend Paul and the African Society in Albany. So this is, this begins to be the first kernels of a visible underground railroad. And finally, fi ben, finally Ben, when he was in his late 30s, would find lasting love. Um, he'd been married previously at least once. Um, she died when he was in his late 20s, early 30s. Um, he was widowed now, but in 1830, he married Maria Coe, who was about 20 years her junior. Maria was born enslaved to Daniel Newcomb in Pittstown in Rensselaer County. Um, and she then subsequently was enslaved by the Reverend Jonas Coe, a very well-known and respected Presbyterian minister in Troy, and his wife Abigail, sister of Elizabeth Newcomb, Daniel's wife. Maria and Ben's marriage would last almost 40 years. They would have 11 children, many of whom would p follow the path of the father. Despite his need to provide for his new family, Ben Jr. remained active in the African Baptist Church and Albany's black community in addition to assuming a major role in what was the nascent Underground Railroad. Sadly, while Ben was building his new life, his father died in 1838. But the good thing is he did live long enough to meet three of his grandchildren, 
which must have been... Nathan Happy, I think it says. Okay, great. Thank you. He was a happy guy. <laughs> can, can you handle 17, please? Do I want what? Can you handle 17, please? Oh, yes. Uh, when ben was an early member of the Albany uh, Underground Railroad Vigilance Committee. Vigilance committees are the front-facing body of, underground, of the Underground Railroad. It dealt with the fundraising, dealt with the white politicians, the police, and the courts as necessary. So these are very, very important groups. And Ben belonged to this along with two white Quaker sisters, Abigail and Lydia Mott, and a number of other black and white men. Abigail and Lydia were related to Lucretia Mott, the famous uh, suffragette. James Mott, Lucretia's husband, yes. was probably a second cousin. Oh, okay. Though through the Mots, he also met their best friends, Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass. Uh, the Mots were cousins. All of these people, along with many of the men he knew from the colored conventions, were part of the spider web underground railroad that spread across the northern states, often funneling through Albany. When we think of the underground railroad, you often think of like these very straight lines between you know, one stop to the next stop. And in actuality, it was much more of a spider web. Um, if you can picture that, there are lots of different connections, um, not just a single route that anyone would take. You never knew if there was danger up ahead of you, so you had to have an alternative. Um, as the years progressed, Ben became one of two black officers of the Eastern New York Anti-Slavery Society. The other was the legendary Reverend Henry Highland Garnett, who was then a minister in Troy. And another member of this society was Henry Stanton, already married to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who we all know from her uh, father or grandfather on Cady Hill. Other members of the society included Hiram Corliss from Greenwich, a well-documented known conductor of UGR routes leading north into Canada. In 1847, Ben sold his property in Albany. And what happened was, I just, I couldn't find him in the city directory anymore. <laughs> And I went looking, and that's how Sean helped me. He spent $3,000. Now, this is a free black man in 1847 who has three grand and buys property in Mon Monroe, New York. F 50 acres initially, was it, Lori? Um, it was up to 90. But he bought 50 originally, I yes, think. Yes, and then he added to it. In Moreau, just south of Glens Falls, about a mile below uh, Reynolds Corners. It was there he and Maria would raise their 11 children, establish an outstanding orchard and farm, and ran an, run an underground railroad station. It seemed an ideal place to raise a family and continue his mission. This is actually a shot that I took from the farm. It's now a candy cane farm in Moreau with Christmas trees, and I think. I think that one right there was my Christmas tree this year. <laughs> my poor husband was on the ground in the snow. Um, but you can see that it's a straight shot. That's the Hudson River. So from the front of their house, it was a straight shot down to the river. Ben also bought, as she said, a second piece of property. You kind of see this on the little map. Here's the main piece of property on Route 32. But he bought a second piece down here right on the canal. So he came, you could come down through here, and literally it was a straight line. Um, not a straight line, but a line down to um, his property. So they would cross over and be easily into um, Washington County. Um, his network included the Baltimores from Troy, related to his wife Maria and other members of the Troy Underground. There were, there were relatives of Susan B. Anthony and the Mott sisters scattered throughout the Washington and Saratoga counties. The yellow stars are where the white men of the Moreau Vigilance Committee lived. Now think about that. What would you need a Vigilance Committee for if there wasn't anything to be vigilant about? Um, those are the orange stars, or the light goldish stars. The red star being where Lattimore's farm is, or was. There's also two yellow stars here. Um, those two stars belong to uh, Henry Harry Hampton and his son-in-law Philip Stanton. 
And you'll see out in the exhibit, there's a census, page from the census, that shows Harry Hampton, Philip Stanton, and the Northrops living very close to each other in Glens Falls. This map is 1856. That census was 1855, right around the time that Northrop's uh, abductors are, are brought to trial, and Northrop disappears soon afterwards. So they must have moved into Moreau. And also living next to them was a family named Van Pelt. Uh, the mother was Hannah, and she had been enslaved in Albany, as had some of her children. And she was she's been identified in the newspaper as one of the first members of the African Baptist Church set up by Lattimore Se Sr. and Sattimore, Lattimore Jr. He had previous, previously been a barber um, in Saratoga Springs. And Lori found a bunch of stuff that's in, in the exhibit. In the exhibit. Yeah. And so next to one another in South Glens Falls, I can't remember the name of the street, you had Solomon Northrop, you had the Van Pelts, you had Philip Stanton, who was married to Solomon's daughter, mm -hmm. and then... The Hamptons, David the, Hamptons. The, the, the Hamptons, who was the brother-in-law of um, Solomon Northrop's wife, Margaret. Uh, yeah, no, and Anne's, 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 Anne's brother. <laughs> Anne's brother, sorry. So, so you begin to see, um, based on connections he made um, in the Eastern New York Anti-Slavery Society, the men and women um, that, that we know were identified from newspaper articles, because by this time, people were not hiding in the shadows in the North. They, had, they, they decided this is what they're going to do. So you can see in newspapers as early as 1835, 1836, anti-slavery societies in Baltimore Spa, anti-slavery societies in Moreau, anti-slavery in Whitehall, like, anti-slavery societies in, in Washington County. So you've got the makings of the Underground Railroad routes that would take people north, either through Vermont, or a straight shot up through New York State. Um, and they were, by that time, apparently coming in droves. And for those of you who, are, who know um, some of the, the history of the Underground Railroad in Saratoga County, which they, they claim, they claim there, there were no Underground Railroad sites, but um, John Weeks' site would have been just south of here in Gansvert, and then over here you would have had um, Fitch in Corinth would have been right over in this area. So they're all kind of right in proximity. And you can kind of really get a sense of that spider web again. There's nothing that's straight. If somebody came here and couldn't go there, they could go there. Or they could come down here and go to Fitch's. So they had this, this very elaborate um, spider web. No other word for it. By now, Ben's children um, were reaching adulthood. Um, his oldest children, Sarah and son Ben, we know worked with him in the late 1850s in the Underground Railroad. They traveled out to Buffalo, where Sarah met and married a man named Jay Sella Martin, who has been lost to history, but he's a very important guy. He had been enslaved for decades from birth, but managed to make it to freedom in 1856. Martin was a really fiery anti-slavery orator. And he was known as the Lion of the West and became a protege of Frederick Douglass. Other older children, sons Jane, Charles, William, and Thomas, and daughters Julia, Fanny, and Alice, Emma, stayed home on the, on the Moreau farm, uh, the hub of the network. Um, Selma Martin is particularly important because he was an, um, an admirer of John Brown. Um, in later years, he claimed that he had been in attendance at the secret meeting with Brown, Douglas, and Harriet Tubman, where Brown first uh, unveiled his plans. It was more than attacking Harper, Harper's Ferry. He just wanted to go after the federal government that supported slavery. Um, the couple, after Sarah and, and J. Sella Martin married, they moved to ba Boston where Sarah founded a fugitive aid society to assist people seeking freedom 
and Sela Martin became pastor of a couple of one first a white and then a black anti-slavery church in the Boston area. I wanted to just point out, I know some of you probably can't read it in the middle here, but um, this is a quote from J. Sela Martin. The simple fact is this prejudice and prescription in free society during the time of slavery kept the white people away from the Negroes so that they knew and still know but little of colored people. And the slaveholder, through knowing better, found it in his interest to keep the knowledge to himself. He caused along, you know, Frederick Douglass, I think, came along for a ride that time. He caused actually a riot in Boston when he eulogized um, John Brown. And he made no bones about it that he believed that the only way slavery would be ended in the United States was to spill blood and lots of blood. Um, Long way in, so. At the out, excuse me. William. I must have skipped. Oh, okay. Yeah, at the outbreak of the Civil War, son William enlisted in the 77th New York, a white Saratoga County regiment. The service of black men in white regiments is exceedingly rare. Um, I did touch base with talk folks at the military museum, and what they said to me was that if he was known to have been black they would have relegated him to the cook tents. They would have, you know, something, something off to the side. But the fact that here he was serving, the call had come up for 13 men to enlist in the Union Army. And we think he might have lied about his age at the time. But he actually signed up, over 100 men responded. Young boys, men, this is in Moreau, responded to the call. They would have gone to school with him. They would have known him. They knew the family was black. And nobody said anything that ever resulted in his being identified uh, officially as a colored person in the New York 77th. And he served for almost five years. Um, at the Battle of Fort Stevens, which is depicted down here, I wish I could have found a better photograph of this because Abraham Lincoln attended this battle. It was right outside uh, Washington, D.C. And one of the things apparently they had to say to Lincoln part way through is, could you like duck down because you're a little tall and your head's sticking up? Um, so um, William was actually the first person wounded in that battle. And uh, ultimately he returned to the unit when he recovered from his wounds and he mustered out at the end of the war in 1865. Sarah and her husband sailed to England a number of times to raise money for the education of black children in the South. Son Benjamin, having seen his sister Sarah married to Stella Martin in Buffalo, they had gone together to a uh, colored convention. Um, he headed west to San Francisco. He began working on a steamship, the Sierra Nevada, and that is an actual image of it, a ship belonging to the Pacific Mail Steamship Company. PMSS ships carried not only the mail, but products and passengers up and down the Pacific coast to Central and South America and to New York. The ships were often used to carry gold and silver from the Western mines to the Union cause. They were very fast and could outrun the Confederate blockades. Ben Jr. lived to see the Union victory and the enactment of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments that ended slavery, provided equal rights for African Americans, and permitted black men to vote. He died in 1871. He was originally interred in Reynolds Corners Baptist Cemetery, but was later moved and buried in Greenridge Cemetery in Saratoga Springs. After the war, Sarah, Sella Martin, and their daughter Josie moved to Washington, D.C., where Sella Martin became the editor of the newspaper The New National Era, published by Frederick Douglass. But he soon left the paper because he needed to make more money to support his family. Around the time, uh, I think he was appointed a postmaster, um, and then he did a couple of other things. Sadly, around the time of Ulysses S. Grant bid for re-election, Sella Martin and Frederick Douglass had a huge falling out due to Sella Martin's support for Horace Greeley 
as recorded in the New York Herald in 1873. Um, by now, the dream of reconstruction was starting to fall apart. The Martin family then traveled to the South, ultimately settling in Louisiana, where Cello Martin rapidly became disillusioned by the failure of Reconstruction and the rise of Jim Crow. I mean, I don't know whether most of you know, but by 1866, the Ku Klux Klan had been formed by Nathan Bedford Forrest, who was one of the Confederate generals. Um, in 1876, Cello Martin overdosed on alcohol and laudanum. A, a devastated Sarah returned to Washington, D.C., where she toured art in the D.C. Colored School until her death in 18 1891. Son Ben, having returned east when his father died, went west again to San Francisco, where he worked as a, as a porter at the Palace Hotel for several decades. The other daughters, there are Emma, mm, well, three of the daughters, Emma, Alice, and Fanny, married men from the Western Mass area and settled there. There's compelling evidence that the families of the men, these men were involved in the Underground Railroad and well known to abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass, friends of their fa father. And recently we think that there may have been um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's husband, Henry Stanton, may have known the families. Another daughter, Julia, married a black man who had served as a sailor in the Civil War and followed her sisters to Northampton. Quick update, because <laughs> I haven't had a chance to tell you this. <laughs> I, uh, I just got a, uh, something today from Berkshire County in Massachusetts. You can see Berkshire here. Um, they're going to be doing a, a series of programs. One of the programs they're doing is on women from the Underground Railroad and the abolitionist movement. And right there in the middle is a picture of Sarah Lloyd Askers. Yes. Sarah, we are a work in progress. <laughs> we are a work in progress. Um, I've been doing, I'm from the Berkshire County, so this, this is particularly you know, important to me, but I've been doing a lot of digging uh, about the Underground Railroad within the area. Sarah Lloyd Asker's son, Luther, uh, married Alice Lattimore. Um, and she's probably one of these blue dots <laughs> here. Um, and they also, and the family ran a sawmill in Lanesboro, Massachusetts, uh, that they made fellows. Does anybody know what a fellow is? I didn't either. It's the round part of a wheel, and that's what they made. Um, there also was recently, last week, another program from the uh, Sand Lake Historical Society on Abel Brown, and Abel Brown is a very important person within Albany, within uh, you know, the whole abolitionist movement coming up through the anti-slavery movement. And um, Abel Brown was a preacher in Sand Lake and they believed they were hauling uh, runaways from Sand Lake in, in big barrels. Now if you own a lumber yard and you're making fellows, you could make a barrel or two. And they would haul them between Lanesboro and Sand Lake and that was one of the routes. But this also shows you that, again, that spidery kind of thing where nothing is straight. And you can also see in the top part here, you've got uh, the batten kill, so you're getting closer to Moreau. And this is where you really begin to see, as the years unfold, that the relationships that were made among black families um, and friends endured for decades. Um, the Lanesboro connection that Lori's just talking about would have probably been in 1842, 1843. And 40 years later, um, you see the daughters of Benjamin Lattimore Jr. marrying the men um, who had been part of the Underground Railroad and their son decades before. Um, by 1880, Emma and her husband, Charles Robert Dorsey, moved to New York City where they lived with their father's old friend, the fiery abolitionist, the Reverend Henry, Henry Highland Garnett, and Robert lists his occupation in the 1880 census as bridge builder. 
So they lived on McDougal Street, down in the southern tip of Manhattan. He was a well-known, really competent mason from the Florence Northampton area, and I don't think it's a stretch to assume that he probably worked on the final, the final pieces of the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, but yet again, the fact that um, they were living in the same household as the Garnets, and the, with the relationship that went back 30 years, once again reinforces th the linkages and the connections between the black community that transcended, transcended uh, generations. You want to go? After their father's death, uh, Thomas and William split their time between the farm and other activities. But it appears they always made sure that at least someone was on the farm or no further away than Saratoga Springs to take care of their mother Maria and their two younger sisters, Bertha and Helen. Charles lived in Saratoga Springs with his wife, Josephine Niles, a Saratoga native. And this is the house that they lived in that still stands on Lincoln Avenue. Uh, he worked as a coachman to the village president, John White, and he bought this house with a mortgage from Mr. White, which was not uncommon. Um, Charles had a very prestigious position. He was the head coachman for the president of the village of Saratoga Springs. That's a somebody. The city was just as much an elegant resort for blacks as whites. Their daughters, Alice and Jessie, were the bells of the Saratoga season in the Gilded Age. Summer visitors included the black elite from the South, Midwest, and Eastern United States. There were grand balls, assemblies, garden parties, picnics, concerts, and dances, all a stone's throw from the exclusive white hotels. Sadly, Josephine Lattimore died young at the age of 44 in 1887, leaving several young children. A year later, the husband of Fanny Lattimore died, leaving the widow with young children as well. And then she moved back to Saratoga Springs from Northampton. It appears that at this point, Grandmother Maria and Aunts Bertha and Helen, as well as Uncles Thomas and William, moved permanent free, permanently from Moreau to Saratoga Springs to help raise the children. We don't know what happened to the farm and from this time in 87 until they sell it. Um, so we're not sure if somebody was uh, taking care of the farm at that point. Although a stalwart of the Reynolds Corner community and the local church, from time to time, Thomas, known as Tommy, would explore what we call side hustles today. At some points, he teams up with Emma's husband, Robert, in salvaging sunken ships. Um, do I have the quote here? He's been engaged with his brother-in-law and raising sunken crafts. And there are other quotes in the paper that talk about some of the things he brought back and showed people. Uh, like his father and grandfather, he began to acquire real estate and bought several properties in Moreau. He probably earned, he probably bought about four, four different properties in the town of Moreau. In 1887, he purchased a house on Nelson Avenue on property which had originally belonged to Madame Jamel. And the other piece to this, as a quick aside, is my hairdresser grew up in that house. <laughs> and, and the day I was telling her about this, she said her father, who's long past, would have just keeled over if he had ever known a black family lived in that house. And they did. William took charge of the family farm and built it into one of the finest farms in the town and the best orchard in the county, as noted in clippings from the Saratogian. He married later in life, and he and his wife, Sarah, there are a lot of Sarahs going on here. It takes that sort of minute. Sarah purchased property on Nelson Avenue in the late 1890s after sale of the farm. Now, this is Lori's find, and I will leave it to her. <laughs> William, known as Billy, joined the Grand Ar Army of the Republic, the Union Soldiers Veterans Organization, in 1885, and he served in multiple capacities in Saratoga Springs. And I actually have to give Jim credit for this because I was in staring at um, a list of names and the picture, and I'm thinking it's oh, it's got to be this tall guy because he was supposed to, the father was real tall. And Jim goes, no, 
is the little guy right here. And he counted them out. So this right here is Bill Lattimore in the Grand Army of the Republic, New York 77th. And he died a couple years after this picture was taken. And that story's on our panel in exhibit two. It's yep. Yep. Now, life back on the farm before they moved was anything but boring. Maria and her two daughters left at home, Bertha and Helen, known as Ella, regularly hosted grand social events at Orchard Rest, as the farm was known, entertaining the children of abolitionists with whom their father had worked in the Civil War. Um, it's during this time that we really begin to see um, a striving black middle class. And a lot of Moors are identified um, in a book called The Black Elite. Um, and Lori will tell you, I put in a bid, by the way, to have the second, the second series of the Gilded Age come to Saratoga. Oh, cool. cool. <laughs> Turns out somebody knows the researcher on it. <laughs> okay. The Lattimores became regulars at a place called the Broughton House. And this is also part of the exhibit out there. Um, the Broughton House, which no longer stands, and in spite of all of my searching, I have not been able to find a picture of it, nor when I first heard about it, and of course I went to the usuals, Field, Mary Ann Fitzgerald, Lauren, nobody had ever heard of it. Well, it turns out the Broughton House was um, opened in 1862 by a man named John Broughton, and he attracted people to, this, to his resort, basically, um, for upper, middle and upper class, mostly upper class, um, African Americans. With the establishment, he had a bowling alley, a bar, a croquet lawn, a barber shop, and a grand ballroom, in addition to two floors of well-appointed rooms and a separate cottage. And as you can see here, if you've, if you've ever followed um, any of the, the Saratogian and the, the arrivals, they used to be noted every day who was arriving for the various hotels. You could tell if your friend where they were staying, if they got here. Um, they initially listed the Brown House and the people who were here. But unfortunately, as the Jim Crow laws began to creep north, you stopped seeing um, much in the local newspapers about the Broughton House um, or any of the activities. And um, a lot of what we see then has to be gleaned from the African American newspapers, specifically New York Age, was very useful. And the um, correspondent for the New York Age is also in the exhibit, and it's Thomas Pennington, Thomas who Pennington. was the black pharmacist in Saratoga Springs. And for many years, he was the correspondent um, sending back snippets of what was happening each week in Saratoga Springs to the New York Age to Thomas Fortune. Um, we call this the Lattimore Circle, the, our program, because everything keeps coming back in a circle. Um, one of the way I discovered the Broughton House, search, I was talking a moment ago about Sarah Lloyd Asker and her son Luther, who married Alice Lattimore. Well, Luther was the first black baseball player in Springfield, Massachusetts. They had semi-pro teams there. Well, it turns out that, um, and, and it was in a book, Gates, on baseball. <laughs> Louis Gates identifies, a book edited by Louis Gates identifies Luther Askin as the first man to integrate baseball. First man to integrate baseball, is absolutely correct. And in there, it started talking about the Broughton House in Saratoga. And I'm like, the what? Um, never heard of it. And um, it turns out the Broughton House was on the corner of William and uh, Hamilton, right where St. Peter's Church is now was the Clarendon Hotel. And the Clarendon Hotel was a temperance hotel, um, which would have uh, appealed to many of the um, African Americans, although they did have a bar at the Broughton House. But the Clarendon Hotel, they sponsored baseball teams. And so did the Broughton House. And everybody, there were integrated teams. Everybody played baseball together. They had a great time. They didn't sleep together. The white guys slept at the Clarendon House, and the black guys slept at the Broughton House. But that's OK. They still had a good time. But that's how I found him, and the circle again, that it, these things just pop up out of nowhere, and they come back. 
Back around. Next one, can I actually do this? Yeah, you can do it. Whoa! <laughs> This image from the 1893 city directory, the only Saratoga, is the only Saratoga directory to identify race, shows only some of the family rem members racially identified. Maria Co. Lattimore died in 1893 at the age of 82 in Saratoga Springs. She's buried in Green Ridge Cemetery. But the story of the Lattimores doesn't end with her death. While most of her children remained in Saratoga Springs in Northampton, Massachusetts, Emma stayed in New York City and became involved with a group of women who formed the National Association of Colored Women, and it included Sarah Garnett and Mary Church Terrell, leading advocates of women's suffrage. Sarah Garnett was the second wife of Henry Highland Garnett, and Mary Church Terrell and her husband Robert had taught in the D.C. colored schools with the oldest sister, Sarah. And that's yet again why we begin to call it the circle. The, the circle, because like I didn't want to call it Forrest Gump. <laughs> um, this this uh, directory is actually again out in the exhibit, as well as a map. Um, unfortunately, the closest I could get in the map was 76. The book is 93, but using the book, I identified places on the map that were uh, that were identified as homes where the African American uh, people lived. So you can see, and again, that's all out in the exhibit. Oh, yeah. All right, Charles's daughter, Jessie, young woman here, married a man named Hardaway Whaling. Hardaway was the head waiter at the Warden Hotel can for, I interrupt for a second? 40 years, yeah. This is how everything is related. This picture of Jessie comes from an album, a photographic album, of a young girl in Albany uh, called Arabella Chapman, actually two photo albums that were found stuck away in the back recesses stacks of the University of Michigan Clement Library. And so clearly, um, Arabella Chapman, who was the first black graduate of Albany High School, knew and admired and liked Jesse Lattimore, and, and Arabella was um, a singer, and she supported herself as a piano teacher after she graduated high school, before she got married, and so clearly you can see the back and forth of this middle and upper middle class black society trying to carve its own way in the world, and it's just yet again things just keep popping up, and we find, wham, they're all related to the Lattimores. Continue. So Hardaway had gone to school with Booker T. Washington in DC and attended Howard University. He was also featured in a W.E.B. Du Bois Negro exhibition at the Paris exhibition in 1900, and he is one handsome man. He would go on to amass a large amount of property in Saratoga Springs, and he became the first president of the city's NAACP in 1919. And this is a listing of all the properties he owned in Saratoga Springs at one time or another. Ooh, I can, He's getting I, good with this. <laughs> go ahead, you can do this. Second wind. Another daughter of Charles, Celia Broughton Lattimore, was the first African-American graduate of Saratoga Springs High School in 80, 1894. And just, I don't exactly know what it means, but let it sink in. First black graduate, Saratoga Springs High School, 1894. First black graduate, Albany High School, 1877. Uh, she went to rural North, North Carolina to teach black children at the Brick School, sponsored by the American Missionary Society. She here appears to have been one of the first members of the faculty arriving at the school which opened in 1895. It ultimately became a junior college before closing in 1933. Charles's son, Benjamin, we're on our fourth Benjamin. This took me a while. Let's get them all sorted out, trust me. Charles's son, Benjamin, married a young woman from Georgia named Maddie G. White. She's the first graduate of Lucy Scribner's Young Women's Industrial Club, and there's the entry, one of the, one of the entries, I think there were two, 
from the trustees minutes at Skidmore College. There are no images of her. There are tons of images of Lucy's school, the students, but not one of the first graduate. Ben and Maddie, like many Saratogians, rented their house during the season, and that is their house. And I, I was just commenting to Julie the other day that the first time I took a picture of this house on Rensselaer Street, that it was really um, run down. It had that old asbestos kind of clabbered on it. You know, it was really not looking good. Somebody must have purchased it, and you can see they fixed it up really nicely. One of the interesting things is if you start reading little snippets in the paper, they were sufficiently well to do that Mrs. Lattimore got to spend her winters in Cuba. In her later years, Emma, who was one of the daughters, um, became one of the founders of the first daycare center for African American children in New York City, the Hope Day Nursery. She was, a first, she was a supporter of the first black YWCA in Manhattan and the group that would ultimately become the Urban League. Helen, who was the youngest daughter, spent time in New York City with her sister Emma and would become the second general secretary of the first black YWCA in Manhattan. She went on to become the director of a home for aged colored women in New Bedford, Massachusetts. The home was at that time under the patronage of Elizabeth Clark, who was the president of the National Association of Colored Women. Helen that position, left that position when her older brother William became ill and she returned to Saratoga Springs to care for him. I just want to say that's around 1912. Bertha blossomed into an accomplished artist. In 1893, her portrait of Robert Purvis, who was included in the New York State exhibit at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Her grandfather, Ben, first met Purvis, a wealthy black man and a founder of the American Anti-Slavery Society in the Second Colored Convention in, Fidel in Philadelphia, and the family co connections remained close for 60 years. There was great consternation among the African American community regarding the exclusion of black Americans from full participation in the fair. The Bertha's accepted entry was her drawing of Robert Purvis, a founder of the AAS and an active member of the Underground Railroad is deliciously appropriate. Four years later, Bertha, now in her early 40s, married Adam Lewis, a friend of her brother's who had worked in Saratoga Springs as a waiter in Congress Hall for over 20 years. They moved to Chicago, but sadly, Adam died in 1900. Adam's death brought the Lattimore children together in a way that really tells you who they were and how they cared for one another. In the three years Bertha had lived in Chicago, she'd made a life for herself, and she decided to stay. Um, she actually owned property uh, valued at about, I want to say, $5,000. It's identified in the newspaper in 1904. Um, so her much older brother Benjamin, who had been spending decades in, in San Francisco, came to live with her in much the same way he'd been the protector of his older sister Sarah when they were involved in the Underground Railroad in Buffalo 40 years before. When Benjamin died, her brothers Thomas and William took turns in Chicago living with Bertha until Thomas moved there permanently. And we are rounding the bend. In time, Thomas and William both died. Helen moved from Saratoga Springs and Emma from New York City to Chicago to live with Bertha, along with Thomas's widow, Callie. They raised the granddaughter of their sister, Fanny, named after her grandmother. Um, her mother, Louisa, became seriously ill and died. The father was, to put it nicely, unfit. So Bertha took the child in, the infant in. While in Chicago, Bertha became close with Ida B. Wells Barnett and Fanny Barrier Williams, two of the leading voices of the time for racial justice. Bertha and Helen were supporters of the Black YWCA and members of the Phyllis Wheatley Club, supported by the National Association of Colored Women. They all lived in a large, in a large house on Calumet Avenue in Bronzeville that's still there, if, if I can believe Google, and the street numbers are okay. 
Around 1929, after Emma, 1928, after Emma passed, Helen, Bertha, Callie, and Fanny moved to Los Angeles, living several blocks away from where their sister Sarah's daughter Josie had lived. Bertha died in 1936. Her gravestone reads, Beloved Sister, Helen was now the last remaining grandchild of Ben Lattimore, Revolutionary War hero. She died in Los Angeles in 1950. The family plots are in Greenridge Cemetery. Um, Charles, Josephine, and Maria's sister Rosetta are here in what's called Section J, the colored section of the cemetery. Um, there's several, there's also Ben, Ju Ben, the fourth first wife before he married Maddie is here as well, as well as Josephine's, I, we think it's mother, sister, aunt, somebody, is over in a corner here, um, just off the frame. Um, the day that I went here, I was looking around and I found uh, these guys in the gray one. I'm like, okay, now where can Rosetta be? I stepped backward and fell over her. She's right here. Um, she, um, she actually worked for Dr. Willoughby. He owned an inn uh, where um, the city center is now. And he also was a very firm abolitionist. There is a park that they are in the process of building in Brooklyn, where he also lived. He was very, very wealthy, um, that they're going to name for him, uh, the Willoughby Park. Uh, the Lattimores are all kind of together. Uh, most of the family is interred on a large plot with a very distinctive memorial. Um, very, if you have done any kind of research at all in the Great Ridge Cemetery records, you can pull up a record of like all the elves, and which I did, of course. Found the Lattimore, and there's a number of them listed. William is the only one who is listed as colored. And that these are these guys are in section S. I guess they moved up from section J. Um, after our original presentation of this program, we had made a note that William was not recognized for his Civil War service. Um, and I'd written a, about William and the fact that his uh, gravestone was not identified in my blog, Friends of Albany History, which you can find on Facebook um, and in WordPress. And the uh, Willard Camp, number 154, Sons of the Union Veterans of the Civil War, uh, hopped to it. They would greet. Um, they cleaned the headstone. They put a GAR marker in front of it and they put an American flag. So shout out to the Willard Camp. Oh yeah. And for William, if he could, he could wave to his commander, General Windsor Brown French, who was literally up on the hill in front of him. And lastly, because this is a circle, Maddie has no gravestone. And that's about all we know about the Lattimores for now. We are finding wow. new things every day. <laughs> But it begins to give you a whole new idea about African Americans in the 19th century, um, at least in our neck of the woods. Any questions? Oh, come on. There must be something. Yes. Are you aware that there are other circles out there we should start looking for of other the question is, are we aware that there are other circles out there and looking at other families? <laughs> they all seem to think of a Venn diagram and they all seem, they, it, it, it's the combination of a Venn diagram or one of those colored paper Christmas change that you put on a Christmas tree. Right. Right. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, maybe some of you have heard of Edmonia Lewis. She recently had, uh, she was the first black African, she was the first African American sculptress. Uh, she originally came from Green, East Greenbush. Um, the Postal Service just issued a stamp in her name. So let me give you an example. Um, she ends up in Boston just before and during the first part of the Civil War. She lives in a house She's a, board, a lodger in a house owned by a family named Howard. Um, 
at about the same time Sarah Lattimore and her husband Stella Martin were living in Boston. And she becomes incredibly good friends with the Howards. Flash forward 30 years later, um, and not only does she know Edmonia, does the family know Edmonia Lewis, but Imogene Howard became the only black uh, manager of the Columbian Exposition, and she decides that she's going to exhibit the artwork of Bertha Lattimore and Edmonia Lewis. So it's like, and there's a whole story of the Howards and who they were related to. Mm -hmm. And so they all intertwine. It, it, does that sort of answer your question? It's like, we can't go into all Every the- family. Yeah. Y y but they all, they all seem to know one another. And where you really find a lot of it, where you can get all the names and put the pieces together is in the New York Age, the black newspaper that reported the doings all across, you know, the eastern part of the United, part of the United States for, you know, the black elite. And you also find it when you look at single African American teachers, for example, in the colored schools in the District of Columbia in between like 1870 and 1910 you begin to see where this all sort comes together. For example, Imogene Howard, who knew Edmonia Lewis, her sister Addie was, became a principal of the Wormley School in DC, and she was Sarah Lattimore's best friend. When Sarah Lattimore dies, all her personal effects go to Addie Howard. It's just this huge spider web and the thing that fascinates us is that it's a world that I, at least, I don't, I didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. No idea. Any other questions? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> other than the Rowan Hair and just looking at some of the dates that you had mentioned, is there any, I know General Grant was up there and the Community Society, so they were living on the farm for that community center. Wasn't there that long? Is there any? No, we don't know. No, no. no. Oh, she's no. asking about. No, no. She, she, um, her question is, is General Grant, who was there in the 80s, um, is there any relationship to anything that with, with the Lattimores? Well, did their past at all? Not that we know. Not that we know. We, have, we haven't seen any evidence to that. We have yet to find, like, the mother load, which is always diaries and journals. So have we're... Have been in touch with relatives? I know when you did your dream. She's asking oh, about relatives. And, yeah, we've... Yeah. we've yeah, there's one family of descendants um, uh, named Jackson that lives in, you know, and they have been enormously helpful. Um, and um, we've talked to them. You know, we're still reaching out. We just haven't found anything. So we're sort of limited to what was reported in the newspapers and can we find the newspapers, y y you know? Yeah, but I, I, re I really think that Grant was so severely ill that I don't. Yeah, it's just because people from Corinne say that their relatives literally walk over the mountain to go see him. He's such a big figure when they're But he couldn't even talk. I mean, what did they do, stare at him? He was only here for six weeks. Yeah, what did they do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. He, was yeah. De he was debilitated with throat cancer. He was working night and day to finish the memoirs so his wife wouldn't be broke. You know, I've only seen pictures. And interestingly, I have found one in family stuff. Um, they sold postcards of Grant and his family yes. sitting on the front porch, and I found one of my Grammy stuff, you know? So, sorry, no. But what we do find is reports of, as we said, families of well-known black abolitionists, their children, who are now becoming doctors and lawyers and poets, coming, I can't describe it, coming to pay homage to Maria. Mm -hmm. you know, they clearly liked her children, but they made this long trek, sort of, out to the farm. And the only way we know, uh, uh, we even began to know what happened is because when Sarah dies, 
there are at least four obituaries that identify her as the daughter of the well-known abolitionist and member of the Underground Railroad, Benjamin Lattimore. And that, that, that's it. That's, so we've been sort of teasing. Tidbits? Teasing is a good word. We scratch, we, scr we scratch, we scrape, we tease. Um, I, was, I was laughing when Julie said, you know, we're, we're trying to find, you know, the, the connections and the linkages to the other family. I've been drowning in uh, Pittstown, Rensselaer County with uh, Maria's family. Uh, having been born in slavery into uh, enslaved in 1813 she had about four or five siblings that were named and then we find there's another group of about four or five siblings and how do they all come together and it's it you know they we, we don't have those primary sources in terms of diaries and journals so we really are um, what we are beginning to find and it's fascinating is that the descendants of the Lattimore's still identify as African-American. But every now and then we get a phone call or an email directed from Pittstown from what we believe are family, families descended from the same group of enslaved people who live with the Newcombs in, in Pittstown. And they all began to identify as white in the 1880s. And in some cases, they knew about it. And in some cases, they've taken ancestry tests and discovered that they have a surprisingly large percent of sub-Saharan African DNA. So it, it's given us a window into how different people survived and different people lived and how the world changed after the Civil War, which was supposed to make things better. And it, 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 in the cases of some African Americans, particularly I think in the Northeast, it made their lives living hell. Any other questions? Thank you. Hey, this is really a fascinating story, but the research that you did was amazing. <laughs> and this is like one family with all these tentacles. And uh, I know when we were working on the, uh, on the exhibit, we found other families uh, did, did you research next, like H. Sands Pennington? You know, <laughs> we, we've already done. We've okay. already done Pennington. Oh, but I, I'm saying there's a lot of information that's out on, uh, you know, in the exhibit. It's, it follows some of this information. Not just found in Northland, you know, which has been well documented, but even some of his stories. Uh, Solomon's the go-to. And the problem is <clears throat> nobody knew about these people. They weren't written up. And until you begin to find the black newspapers like, okay, the first black newspaper was Freedom's Journal. It was published in New York City in 1828 to about 1830. The second black newspaper, which basically folded because it was full of fire and brimstone, was published by a man in Albany, New York. It was called uh, the African Sentinel. Um, and Ben Lattimore Jr. named his child, one of his children, after the guy. And basically his paper folded because he said, yeah, Nat Turner is white. Next time just don't slaughter women and children. And, and so if you can find the old newspapers, you can find the people. Thank you. Thank you very much.